Hello and welcome to a Revision Screencast on Skill Acquisition. Today's focus is going to be on um, a massed practice, distributed practice, fixed practice and varied practice. This is going on then, uh, moving on from the last uh, screencast which looked at uh, the part whole, part progressive and whole part whole. So we're going to have a look there now, same kind of principle applies here. We have to be able to do our basics, so we have to be able to describe each one and be able to give an example, low order question. Then we've got to be able to move up and start to talk about, can we understand the uses that make these practice types so effective? As always, the key discriminators between which uh, practice type is going to be most effective for what different things are based around ability and classification of skills. You might already look at these now and think, oh, I know straight away, um, the type of practice that is good for a high ability, for low ability, autonomous, cognitive, and I might even be able to give some classification of skills that are effectively used in these different types of practices. If not, keep listening and we'll see what we can do to try and kind of uh, really kind of cement that memory and be able to apply it to questions. Questions you could get on this. Uh, obviously the basic ones I went through there, describe an example. I'm not putting that on this one now. Another type of example, this is, shows you how you might uh, get questioned to explain when each of mass distributed, fixed and varied uh, physical practice methods could be used to improve the performance of skills when each of them could be used, 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 used. So it's looking there for you to be able to give an advantage, something that makes it effective. So this is not describing it, this is not exampling it, this is giving it when it's most effective to be used. And then going on from there, I put the same question and kind of changed the practice types on that. So again, discuss the use of. Bigger question, requires example, but also re um, requires at least two evaluative points or effectiveness points um, for that, as we talked about before. So let's have a look then, let's get into the action so if we go in first up then so we're looking at our first types of practice mass practice okay so mass practice then is it's, it's this way I mean basically practicing on mass but you can't say that so you've got to say continuous practice with very few rest intervals so what you're saying then is you're doing something over and over and over again so for example a good example you see basketball players doing free throws okay so free throws a really good example or a set shot in basketball just to keep practicing and practicing and practicing because they start and finish so you get lots of repetition now on the, the flip side to this of course is is the other type of practice that doesn't want you to repeat uh, continuously without breaks or very few breaks it's distributed practice now distributed practice is the other type of practice and this basically says you have a burst of practice but then you follow it with many rest intervals so you practice rest practice rest this is really good for extremely explosive and um, fatiguing activities such as a uh, sprint starts for example which is a good way a good example i'm sure you could think of other ones rugby tackles for example and um, so what we'll have a look at then is kind of looking at the advantages so we've got to make sure that we know the effectiveness and we'll have a look at disadvantages not as important but still you do need to know them so if let's have a look at mass then so what is it that makes mass practice when is it most effective when is it most effectively used we're always we're thinking of ability can we start to think of what ability level uh, this would be most effective for and why and then can we start to build up and start to talk about any classification skills for example that would be effectively used with repeated practice without breaks so Let's have a look then. Why is it so effective? Well, first off, um, mass practice is good because it allows motor programs, which are these movement plans in your brain, to become grooved. Okay, so you groove it in your brain so it becomes kind of habitual. On top of that, it's also effective for high ability performance, particularly high ability performance in mass practice because they have high motivation. So they're motivated to repeat and repeat and repeat and get this muscle memory that allows you to perform skills habitually. On top of this, it's really good for simple skills because you, it's difficult to keep doing something over and over and over again that's very complex because you have to think about it a lot. So it's really good for simple skills with low decision making that you don't have to think too much about. On top of that, you have, it's really, this is really important one I think, it's really important for, or effective for discrete skills because it's very different, difficult to continuously practice things over and over again if they don't finish. So what you're looking here is for discrete skills because they have a clear beginning and end. They end quickly so you can practice again. The downside, of course, to mass practice is it's not particularly effective for dangerous skills because if they are fatigue-based uh, kind of activities, um, that could lead to injuries. It's really important you understand this. It's not effective for, for dangerous skills because it dangerous skills can lead to fatigue and injuries so really important and also doing something over and over and over again for the majority of people is relatively demotivating and you think that's why professionals are different to the majority because they practice the basic things over and over and over again they groove the motor program now distributed practice then um, let's have a quick look at that 
a distributed practice, this is where you get breaks. Now, obviously, this has massive, massive um, advantages. So the rest intervals can be used for a variety of things. Um, well, let's go look at the first bit here. Firstly, it's the most effective type of practice for low ability. Okay, so low ability performers or cognitive performers, the breaks allow them to get mental rehearsal. They allow them to have physical uh, relaxation. And it also allows feedback from the coach. It's really important, you know, these two points as an advantage of um, kind of a distributive practice on top of this um, it's really good for complex skills okay and on top of that um, it's really good for uh, gross skills that use large muscle movements that your body needs to rest from but also your brain will need to rest from these ones okay so going on from here it's not so effective because so if you're constantly having practice then a break practice then a break i've kind of used this term here disrupt okay distributed practice disrupts and what happens is of course the downside is if you keep stopping when somebody is getting it disrupts the flow of the movement so if, you know if, if every time you stop and you've all been in situations in games or practices where a coach stops it a lot and you might feel you're not really getting to get a flow of that skill on uh, top of that disruptions or if the breaks are too long this can become demotivating now if I said to you from that now, a lot of information there really, but ultimately we've got some common themes, haven't we? We've got these common themes linked to ability, okay, comes through here. We just need to make sure we know which one goes where. We've also got these uh, classification of skills here. So let's have a look then. What are we going to do to help us memorize this? So if you get a question that's asking you to uh, compare the use of or compare the effectiveness of mass and distributed, because remember this is an invo kind of exam uh, command word, we need to make sure we can do that. So if we have a look then, let's have a look. Mass practice, we're going to use this as our trigger, okay, to help us hook all the memory information for distributed as well. So let's have a look. So mass practice then. Instead of mass, we're going to respell master M-A-S-D. DD. Okay, these are the most important, but if you can remember these, that's absolutely fantastic. So we've got it onto there. So what we're going to do then, oh, you might all be able to work it out, but we're going to try and translate respell master MASD. Okay, and then can we try and work out from what was over there what the effectiveness or how this type of practice was effective for performance. So let's have a look then on here. So MAST basically translated to motor program grooving for the M. Ability that it's good for a high ability, it's good for simple skills, and it's good for discrete skills. However, the DD is that it's dangerous because uh, it's due to fatigue, uh, dangerous because it can lead to fatigue uh, and injury, and demotivating, okay, so doing something over and over again. So that is your kind of uh, memory method there. You can see how that translates over to that. And once you've got this, of course, this is a hooked acronym because it allow, it's the pivot point to allow you to memorize the other. Because if you look at this, you're very easily able to say, if if I know the advantages for mass practice, I can use ability and classification of skills and then just remember the other ones. So if I know that mass practice is effective for high ability and it's good for discrete skills, okay, or it's good for simple skills, sorry, I can then straight away turn it over and say, well, there you go. Distributed practice is better for low ability because they get the breaks uh, to get feedback and mental rehearsal. It's also good for uh, complex skills because the high levels of decision making it gives you it gives you a chance to have a period of me kind of a mental break uh, from the activity you're doing. So hopefully you can see how you can translate this into. Um, relatively easy ways to describe the effectiveness. So if I put you over now, it's probably, you need to give yourself a quick test to see if that makes sense to you. So let's have a look. So if I put it onto here, if we had that question come up, do you think you could use this now? Pause it. How many of the effectiveness or kind of advantages, I suppose, and then maybe disadvantages of mass practice, can you remember? And then can you hook that information to give two effective uses of distributed practice? And that will really put you in a position to answer any question on these practice types. So let's move on then. So let's have a look at our next type of practices. So now we have to need to have a look at variable and fixed. So variable practice, then, it's this kind of practice that we're all used to, I imagine. It's a practice, it's a practice where the conditions or the environment are constantly changing. They're unpredictable. For example, when you go into practice, it's usually done, you know, it might be a small sided game or kind of in this situation, a variable practice, a five versus three possession game in football or rugby or netball or hockey. And these are the activities where you know it's a possession, you're passing, the defenders are trying to get it. What, now, this is very different to fixed practice because fixed practice is where the practice conditions do not change or the environment does not change and it's predictable. So this is things such as shot put. Well, it could be passing, but you're saying passing through um, two cones with no defenders, okay, but the conditions at 
absolutely do not change. Now, you can start to see now in, your, in the uh, classification of skills, you'll remember that we talked about certain classification of skills, which talked about environments changing or not changing, affected by the environment, not affected by the environment. So you might already now be able to pick out the classification of skill that's most effective for the different types of practice. So let's go around, first of all, then variable practice. What are the advantages? First up. It's really, really effective for high ability performance or autonomous performance because um, they have a good understanding of the skill in a closed environment so they can now start to practice it in a changing environment. On top of that, it, the most important thing about kind of variable practice is it replicates the information processing of game situations. So what this means is it allows a positive transfer of what you're doing in practice, e.g. this 5v3 passing, effective transfer into a game or positive transfer into a game situation it's way more likely than that if you're passing through a, a hoop okay because that's not going to ever happen in a game and you've got no defenders on top of this it's obviously extremely good for open skills externally paced skills anything that involves the environment changing on top of that it develops this massive thing here that you know it's took out of our specification really which I don't agree with but it's basically saying that it develops something called schema which are these generalized motor programs we have in our brain that allow us to adapt to new situations that is why elite football players you could say are PhD students in their sport because they have developed all of these motor programs in their brains that are generalized and can adapt to any new situation okay and that's what makes the top performers uh, you know what they are on top of that the, the downside of course to practicing where a condition change it can be really confusing for cognitive performance and it's not particularly effective for closed skills because closed skills the environment doesn't change and this is where the environment constantly does change although it can be used to groove those on top of that then let's, let's flip it over so variable where the conditions do change Let's have a quick look at fixed practice then. So fixed practice is really effective for overlearning and grooving skills. It's a really good thing because there's no environmental pressure. There's no environment changing, so it allows you to overlearn and groove skills. It's also good, this hook information. If variable practice with conditions are constantly changing, okay, develops decision making and information processing fixed practice when the environment doesn't change is really good for low ability cognitive performance because they can get confidence uh, without environmental changes so often you'll see young uh, beginners in, in invasion game sports practicing without any defense just kicking a ball for example in football through uh, a little samba goal that's why they do it because it allows them to groove the skill there so uh, closed skills it's obviously extremely effective for closed skills the skills you control the timing of because the environment doesn't change so closed skills are uh, skills that are not effective by the environment therefore they're really effectively used in fixed practice not effective why because doing things where there's no environmental change can be demotivated high ability don't particularly feel uh, autonomous performance don't particularly feel challenged and it's not so effective for closed skills as you can see on here a lot of them are just reversing what the advantages were from the others so let's have a look then so if we look at this how are we going to memorize this so when you get a question that asks you to compare fixed and variable uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to use variable as our start pivot point and we're going to start to see if we can use an acronym from variable that's if you're struggling of course and you need something to help you so if we're looking at compare the use of variable and fix we start off here so variable then we're just going to say variable practice equals varies okay the v is silent and what we have to do then is our a is always a constant in any acronym when it's talking about practice so now what we have to do is we just want to put that across we've got here so varies a terms to ability and autonomous because variable practice is most effective for high ability or autonomous performers R turns into replicate, so it replicates the information processing in game situations, okay? That allows it to be transferred easier. It's effective for environmental skills or environmental change skills, so for example, open skills or externally paced. And the S is it's most effective for uh, kind of developing schema, which are those generalized motor programs. So if you look at that now and think, right, could I have a go uh, at looking at this and think, right, what could I get from this? All I would ask you to do is make sure you can keep this A in. You've got an A for mast um, and distributed there. You've got whole and part, O far. You've got the A in that. The A always goes through. So if you can remember that it's good for high ability, whereas this one's good for low ability, you've got one. If you think about this as being good for open skills, uh, whereas fixed practice is good for closed skills. And then you can see that um, coming into here. So to make sure you can get at least two things here in for your kind of... Uh, just compare the use of so that's how you hook it you use variable practice equals varies varies can you pick out the a maybe and the e or if you can get other stuff that's absolutely fantastic then you hook that a and the e to give you the advantages or effectiveness of um 
fixed practice as well. So if I turn over here, have a look at that. If the question was, uh, describe or compare the use of variable and fixed practice when learning skills, do you feel you could use this as a way to so pause it now? How many can you remember of the effectiveness for uh, variable practice and can you hook a couple over to give advantages of fixed practice? Do you want to have a go at the exam question here?